welcome you back to Prophecy Update with Dr. Andy Woods. And we have been talking about some reasons why the church will not be on the earth during the tribulation period. One of the things that we were talking about is the church cannot be on the earth during the tribulation period. Why? Because the church is promised an exemption from divine wrath. Now, when I talk like this, I get people on social media that send me all these pictures of Christians being mistreated and beaten and flogged and all of these kinds of things all around the world. Everybody starts to give me these lectures about Christian martyrdoms as if I didn't know anything about that. I'm a subscriber to the uh, a ministry that you know tabulates these things, and I get regular uh, emails documenting these martyrdoms, and they they think because these martyrdoms exist, which they do and they're growing, that somehow this promise uh, can't be true, that the Christian is promised an exemption from divine wrath. Well, what they have not been able to distinguish or discern is the fact that there are different forms of wrath in the Bible. For example, there is ordinary trials that we experience as Christians. John 16, verse 33, where Jesus says, In the world you will have tribulation. There is also man's wrath that we experience. Uh, Paul said to Timothy, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. There is also Satan's wrath that we regularly experience. Paul says to us, For our struggle it's not against flesh and blood, but rather against rulers and powers, against forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. In fact, over in uh, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, you'll see a record there of the church under Satan's wrath where Jesus says to the church at Smyrna, the devil is about to throw some of, some of you into prison for 10 days. So it's very clear that the church experiences satanic wrath quite regularly. And beyond that, we also face the wrath of the world system. Jesus told us that, didn't he, in the upper room? If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me first before it hated you. If you're of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, and I have chosen you out of the world, and because of this, the world hates you. And so the reality of the situation is, as a Christian, I'm a candidate for trials. I'm a candidate for man's wrath. I'm a candidate for Satan's wrath. I'm a candidate for the world's wrath. But there is a form of wrath that I am exempted from as a member of Christ's bride and body, and that's divine wrath. And so when people, you know, say this, this can't be a promise, that we're exempted from divine wrath, look at all the problems that Christians are facing today and have faced for the last 2,000 years. They don't know how to distinguish the different forms of wrath that are described in the Bible. Uh, they assume all wrath is the same, and it all comes from the same source. And the reality of the situation is that's not biblical and that's not true. So we are candidates for tribulations, little t, but not for tribulation, the tribulation, capital T. We are candidates for trials, little t, but not for the trial, capital T. We are candidates for all kinds of suffering and wrath in this world system, and I'm not marginalizing anybody's suffering. But we are not candidates for divine wrath. And as bad as suffering is today, it's nothing compared to the actual wrath of the Lamb that will be poured out on this earth through the opening of the seven-sealed scroll by Jesus himself that will bring these judgments to the earth. And we can praise the Lord that we are not candidates for the ultimate form of wrath. Why am I a pre-tribulationalist? Number one, the tribulation period concerns Israel. Number two, there are no biblical references to the church on the earth during the tribulation period. Number three, the church is promised an exemption from divine wrath and the tribulation period represents 
a divine expression of wrath on the earth. Let me take you to number four in our list here. Number four, you might recall, the rapture is imminent. The rapture can take place, as we have studied, at any moment. You might recall that when we were working through the what question, what is the rapture, one of the points we made is that the rapture can occur any time. It's a signless event. It can occur in the next split second. In fact, the rapture could even occur today. And I went through many, many verses demonstrating that, documenting that from God's Word. And so I won't reread all of those verses to you. I have some of them there on the screen, but just go back into prior shows and you'll see our defense of the imminency of the rapture. You know, the great rapture, pre-trib rapture defender, Dr. John Walvert of Dallas Seminary had a plaque in his office and it read this, perhaps today. In other words, perhaps today the rapture can occur. Now, with that in mind, let's uh, take a look at some of these rapture positions. Can the mid-trib rapture happen in the next split second? The answer to that is no. Does the plaque perhaps today apply to the mid-trib rapture? Mr. Mid-Tribulationalist, can Jesus in the rapture come back today? No, he can't. Why not? Well, according to our prophetic scheme, 42 months of tribulation must happen first. Okay, Mr. Post-Tribulationalist, can Jesus come back today? No, he can't. Why not? Because seven years of the tribulation period must elapse before Jesus can come back in the rapture. Mr. So-called pre-wrath rapturist, better name three quarters, we're going to be here for three quarters of the tribulation period rapturist, can Jesus come back today? Answer, no, he cannot come back today because roughly three quarters of the tribulation period must elapse before Jesus Christ can come back. Now let me ask the same question to the pre-tribulationalist, the viewpoint that I'm contending for here. Can Jesus come back today? Yes, he can. He can come back at any minute. He can come back at any second. He can come back uh, before this uh, broadcast is even o over. And so only pre-tribulationalism deals fairly with the doctrine of eminency and all of the passages that we went through indicating that the rapture can happen at any moment. You cannot believe in eminency believing in mid-trib, post-trib, pre-wrath rapturism. The only way that the doctrine of eminency makes any sense is if you are a pre-tribulationalist. And so that becomes another reason why I believe the rapture will take place before the tribulation period even begins. Only pre-tribulationalism handles well the doctrine and the teaching in the scripture of eminency that the rapture is an any moment event that can occur next and will occur next on the prophetic horizon. There is no prophetic sign that must be fulfilled before the rapture can occur. Some of the quotes I gave to you like Frankie Schaefer in prior shows where he thinks we don't think the rapture can occur until the Jews have been regathered to their land. I use that quote to show his lack of understanding of the doctrine of the pre-trib rapture. He's criticizing something he doesn't understand because we don't teach that. We don't teach the Jews had to be gathered before the rapture can occur. The rapture could occur at any moment over the last 2,000 years. Now, the regathering of the Jews to Israel, setting the stage for the seven-year tribulation period, that is not a sign for the rapture. That is a sign for the second advent and the setting of the stage for the tribulation period and the second advent of Jesus where he comes back to the earth, his feet touch the Mount of Olives, concluding that seven-year tribulation period. The Jews in the land is a stage-setting event for that event, but not for the rapture. Let me take you, if I could, to a fifth 
reason why I believe that the church will not be here during the tribulation period itself. Number five, the doctrine of the rapture is designed as a comfort to the believer. That's why God gave the doctrine to us. Not to terrify us and scare us, but to comfort us. And virtually every time, maybe not every time, but many times when the rapture is mentioned in Scripture, it's couched in languages of comfort to the Christian. For example, the doctrine is unfolded, I believe, for the very first time in the upper room in John 14, 1 through 4. We've looked at this passage several times in our study. But notice verse 1, it says, Jesus says before he introduces the doctrine of the rapture, Do not let your heart be troubled. I mean, the whole thing is there to comfort the Christian. And in the clearest rapture passage that we have, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, how does Paul end his remarks? Therefore, verse 18, comfort one another with these words. Titus 2 and verse 13 refers to the rapture as the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, it's, uh, it's sort of interesting. I um, used to buy a whole bunch of books. I remember one time I bought a whole bunch of books at a particular bookstore, and they were all related to the subject of prophecy and eschatology, because this has always been a great interest of mine. And I was bringing all of these books to the checkout counter, and the person, you know, was going through the books, and tabulating their prices and ringing up my bill and they kept looking at one prophecy title after another in the books I was purchasing that day and the person said to me you know all this stuff really scares me and I have to be honest with you when I heard the person say that my heart sort of sunk because I felt sad for that person uh, either they hadn't they don't they hadn't been taught the doctrine correctly or maybe they don't understand it at all because the reality of the situation is if you're hearing a bunch of teaching on prophecy and all you're doing is becoming more and more fearful and afraid, uh, you, you're missing the point as to why God gave the doctrine of prophecy. You're missing the point as to why God gave the doctrine of the rapture. And sometimes you can go to certain prophecy conferences in the United States or around the world, and I call them gloom and doom conferences because all they talk about how how bad everything is and how how much worse it's going to get well is that balanced teaching it's not balanced teaching at all when you look at these biblical texts and passages god gave the doctrine not to terrify christians but as a comfort and as a blessing and as a hope and you know i grew up with a video series on prophecy maybe some of you had this played in your youth group as well called the thief in the night series i enjoyed a lot of things about the series but the problem with it is they portrayed the rapture as a thief coming in the night that's where the title comes from thief in the night the problem is the thief in the night is never used in the Bible to describe the rapture. Why is that? Think about this for a minute. A thief breaking into your house in the night, is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's a bad thing, isn't it? And yet the rapture is not a bad thing. It's a blessing. It's something designed to inculcate comfort in the life of the Christian. And so there is uh, an awful lot of imbalance on this teaching of the rapture. The thief in the night, what is that? That's the judgment of God overtaking unsuspecting unbelievers after the rapture has already occurred. That's the judgment that follows. But the rapture itself is by no means a thief in the night. And if you look at the context of all of the references in Scripture to a thief in the night, you'll see that none of them apply to the rapture. They all apply to judgment overtaking unsuspecting unbelievers after the judgment, after the rapture rather, has occurred. So the rapture is a comfort. Can I ask you a, a simple question? Whether it's from John 14, 1, 
1 Thessalonians 4, verse 18. Titus 2, verse 13. The rapture is a comfort. Can I ask you a very simple question as you look at all of these rapture views? Which one of these comforts you? Are you comforted by mid-tribulationalism? That the doctrine being you're going to go through 42 months of the wrath of God and hell on earth and assuming your head is not cut off by the Antichrist, you have the hope of being raptured halfway through? I mean, does that doctrine fit with Christ's statement, comfort one, comfort the, one another with these words? Paul's statement, comfort one another with these words. Paul's statement, the blessed hope. Paul's statement, do not let your heart be troubled. I mean, there's no comfort in that doctrine at all. Post-trib is even worse. You're going to go through the whole thing. And assuming you're not martyred and your head is not cut off by the Antichrist, or assuming you haven't been killed because you've been experiencing the wrath of God, you've got the hope of being raptured at the end? Comfort one another with these words? I mean, it doesn't make any sense at all. Pre, So-called pre-wrath rapturism, mislabeled, three-quarters. They've got us going through three-quarters, roughly, of the tribulation period. And you really don't have uh, any hope of being raptured until 75%, roughly, of the tribulation period has expired. Comfort one another with these words. I have no comfort in pre-wrath, post-trib, mid-trib. The only comfort that I have is in the top view, pre-trib, that we are removed from this earth via the rapture before the Lamb begins to open the seven-sealed scroll. We are the only view that makes any sense of imminency that it could happen today. We are the only view that makes any real sense of the teaching of the rapture always being associated uh, with comfort. In fact, there have been times in my life, just for the sake of argument, I have tried to convince myself of mid-trib and post-trib and three-quarters rapturism. And you know what that did to my outlook on life? I became very gloomy, very depressed, uh, very sad, very fearful of the future. And you really don't develop joy in the Christian life under those perspectives. You're always fearful of what's right around the corner. How different the pre-trib view is. That we are in this world, we have difficulties, but this world is not our hope. We're actually going to be delivered from the wrath of God before the tribulation period even begins. You know why there's so many gloomy, sad-faced saints out there, kind of like Eeyores, as I call them? Always depressed, always down, never really walking in the joy of the Lord. It's because they've got a really distorted, off-balance eschatology. Only when your eschatology is corrected, I believe, do you enter into the fullness of the Lord. And so people say, well, you know, prophecy is just not practical. Are you kidding me? It, it affects your mental outlook on life. And so rap, pre-trib rapturism makes the best sense of the prophecies of comfort. Why don't I believe the church will be in the tribulation period? The tribulation concerns Israel. There are no biblical references to the church on the earth during the tribulation period. The church is promised an exemption from divine wrath. The rapture is imminent. And the rapture is a comfort. And let me start this sixth one here. I may not get through this in this particular session, but we'll pick it up in the session that follows. Number six, the Antichrist cannot come to power until the church's restraining ministry is removed. Now, what starts the tribulation period? There's a lot of confusion on this. A lot of people think the rapture starts the tribulation period. It does not start the tribulation period. What starts the tribulation period is the peace treaty between the Antichrist and unbelieving Israel. Daniel 9 and verse 27 is very clear on that. He, that's the Antichrist, will make a, fir a firm covenant with the many, that's Israel, for one week. The moment that treaty is entered into is the moment the seven-year countdown begins. Now, having said all that, when you go over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 
verses 6 and 7, you learn that the Antichrist, who enters into the peace treaty with Israel, which starts the seven-year tribulation period, that Antichrist can't even come upon the scene until the restrainer is removed. We see that teaching in 2 Thessalonians 2, 6 and 7. It says, and you know what restrains him now, so that, the, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is out of the way. The Antichrist can't even come forward today to enter into this peace treaty which will start the tribulation period until the restrainer is removed, which really takes us now to the $20 question, or probably more than $20, the $2 million question, who is the restrainer? You ever ask yourself that? Well, there's a lot of different views on this. A lot of people say, well, the restrainer is Rome. You know, Rome was uh, bearing the sword in Paul's day. Paul talks about the government as a restrainer of evil, and so Rome must be the restrainer. The problem is Rome is gone, and the restraint is still here, and we don't have the Antichrist yet. Other people say, well, no, the restrainer is the devil himself. Satan is the restrainer. Now, does that make any sense when you understand that the Antichrist is an expression of Satan? 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 9 says, That is the one who is coming in accord with the activity of Satan, this is the Antichrist, with all power, signs, and false wonders. I mean, the Antichrist is Satan's man of the hour. A lot of people, even myself, believe that Satan himself, when he has his opportunity, will possess the Antichrist, just like he possessed the body of Judas in John 13 I think it's around verse 27. So if that's true, how could the restrainer be Satan? Why would Satan fight Satan? Why would Satan resist his man of the hour? And uh, didn't Jesus teach in Matthew 12 that a kingdom divided against itself, what? Cannot stand. Satan is not going to fight against Satan. So the restrainer uh, can't be Satan. Other people speculate, well, the restrainer is, is human government. After all, Paul teaches that in Romans 13, the government restrains evil. Well, guess what? The government can't be the restrainer because the Antichrist will control maximum government. He will control government at its highest level, the New World Order, which will be a surveillance society that will enslave the masses. I mean, how can government be the restrainer when the Antichrist will use government to enslave the masses. And by the way, um, if you were living in Cuba, for example, or under some totalitarian dictatorship, you think the people in Cuba think that the restrainer is the government? No, the restrainer could not be the government because the government is the one persecuting people under totalitarianism. Other people have speculated that the restrainer must be Michael the Archangel, and yet that formula doesn't work either because when you go over to the book of Jude, verse 9, notice what it says, But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not pronounce against him a railing judgment, but he said, The Lord rebuke you. Michael the Archangel, as powerful as he is, doesn't like to get into open contests with Satan. And so here in Jude, there was some kind of dispute between Michael and Satan concerning the body of Moses, and Michael didn't want to get into the contest with Satan. He just handed the whole thing over to the Lord. So why would Michael be so active in resisting the Antichrist, Satan's man of the hour. So the restrainer isn't Rome. The restrainer isn't Satan. The restrainer isn't human government. The restrainer is not Michael. Well, then who is the restrainer? The restrainer is none other than the Holy Spirit. You say, well, why do you think that? 
I mean, why do you think that the restrainer here is none other than the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity? Well, think about this for a minute. Whoever this restrainer is, he's got to be omnipotent to hold back Satan's man of the hour that's described in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9. Only God can do that. Well, the, well, the Holy Spirit fits that description very well. Why is that? Because the Holy Spirit, as a member of the Trinity, is fully full deity. Beyond that, there is a shift in Greek in the participle restrainer from 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 6 to verse 7. It's interesting that the participle, and gender is very important when you study Greek. The participle is neuter in verse 6, restrainer, but masculine in verse 7. There's a switch in gender. That's a great description, folks, of the Holy Spirit. Because pneuma, the Greek noun for spirit, is a neuter noun, and yet Jesus, in the upper room, frequently used the masculine pronoun he to describe the Holy Spirit. He did that in John 14, verse 17. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides in you and will be in you. So understanding the Holy Spirit as the restrainer handles not just the concept of omnipotence, but it handles really well the switch in gender in the participle restrainer from neuter to the masculine in verses 6 and 7. And there's some other reasons why I believe that the Holy Spirit is the restrainer. And I'll be connecting the dots for you in our next show together and demonstrating how all of this is very significant for the doctrine of pre-tribulationalism. I hope you're enjoying uh, Prophecy Update with Dr. Andy Woods as we continue to navigate our way through this very important doctrine. We will see you next time. God bless you.